if I may, Your Honor, <coughs> add to what Mr. K said that let's accept that Article 7.2 reflects international law if one accepts that national developments altogether is an expression of a growing understanding between nations and peoples that such a custom is a right expression of the law. But the real issue then is <coughs> if Article 7.2 is supposed to reflect international, to reflect a customary international law, does the wording of Article 7.2 reflect <coughs> international law? And there <coughs> we have a problem. According to Article 7.2, if we deal with functional responsibility, the test is, to say very simply, knowledge or awareness, power and negligence or failure to correct. That may be right for commanders because there is enough evidence to argue that that test is valid under international, uh, un, under uh, customary international law to see whether a commander is a responsibility for what he did in that capacity. But we wonder if such evidence is, is <coughs> available if, if it comes to a head of state. And what we argue here is, is the test as <coughs> provided in Article 7 to the right test to apply at a head of state? So if the court would agree with that, there is more to test than what is in Article 7 to. In that respect, Article 7 to does not reflect customary international law. Now, before moving on, let me reflect for a moment again on the position of the amicus curiae. Um, the court has put it to Mr. K that if you raise an issue, there should be a good showing. In general, we would accept that. But we are not the defense lawyers of Mr. Milosevic. We are amicus curiae. And as I tried to explain at the very beginning, at this stage, at this very stage, at the very beginning, where we have recently appointed, we react to objections, observations made by the accused. And we try to explain to the court what the accused is saying. So if there is a showing, the showing should be on, should be by the accused and not on the amicus curiae. What I'm saying here, here is the, the, the onus of a sh uh, showing of the amicus curiae may not necessarily be the same as the onus on the accused. We are not one unit. It's not one thing, the defense, Mr. Rothwich and the amicus. So if we argue that actually, perhaps it's not arguing, if we translate what the accused says and we argue on basis of that translation what the meaning is and what perhaps the consequences might be for your court, and we advise the court how to see it, to take into account other arguments related to what the accused have said, it is a little bit difficult to find out at this stage what exactly is the onus on, on, on us. Perhaps we will find the right answers later on. At this stage we believe it's not quite clear if there is a full onus on us. That's a matter to be studied. I think it, it was a figure of speech. I understand Not that. a precise onus. We are all uh, finding our way. That's right. With, with the position of amicus. I appreciate that. And, uh, and the world. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, now let me move on to uh, the issue I was going to cover, 
and that is um, the advisory opinion. We have written in our brief that if one studies the uh, literature on the appeals chamber's decision in the Tadic case, um, one of the comments that have been made is the issue of should a court consider its own jurisdiction, its own co uh, competence. I'm fully aware that the issue is a common issue in most jurisdictions. At the end of the column, one judge at the end of it, for example, the Supreme Court, should judge its own competition, uh, uh, competence. Here, we have a different situation. We are discussing not the competence on the usual issues, but we are discussing the competence in terms of the establishment, the legality of the establishment. That is not a thing that usually is debated in the national setting at the end of the column by, for example, a Supreme Court. So, I think some authors are right if they say it could perhaps, perhaps have been done better if someone else... So, departing from that point, we believe that it is possible for your trial chamber not to refer the case as the prosecution asserts, but to consider the possibility of asking an advisory opinion and ruling yourself on the basis of that advisory opinion. It's your responsibility to rule on the matter. But we advise to split up in refining yourself to the formal function of taking the decision, but for the substance asking an advisory opinion. Now, under the Charter, and under the RCG as well, RCJ as well, it is not impossible to do, either by asking it yourself if you believe you've got an inherent authority to do so, or by asking the General Assembly or the Security Council to allow you to do so. And uh, the amicus curia have found no precedent, no argument, why you should not be allowed to ask for such leave. And actually, talking about showing, the prosecution has not shown there is any valid legal argument that might bar such a request. And we have not seen or heard any argument which explains why the General Assembly or why the Security Council would deny such a request. So, we believe it's a possibility which should be pursued. We believe the trial chamber seriously consider that avenue to see whether the answers of the ICJ attribute or perhaps not confirm the Tadic uh, decision of the appeals chamber but is heading for a totally different direction. And then at the end of, of the day I think there won't be any criticism at, at, at anymore. And a set of judges who are not in force have advised this court how to proceed. So we believe there's no reason to simply deny it. Serious consideration to avoid any further criticism on the issue. That's Mr. Vladimir, if we'll consider that. Yes. Are there any more submissions? Yes. Your Honours, I would not dwell on matters which 
My learned colleagues, Mr. K and Mr. Vladimirov, have already addressed and explained very well how all three of us understand our role as amici courier. Our position is, in fact, that if the need should arise, we might even separate our opinions and uh, somebody may adopt a separate opinion. What I would like to ask uh, is just for a few minutes of attention as I come from a country of which the president for a time was Slobodan Milosevic. And I have to submit here a few important points linked to my position as a member of the Amici Curia in such a case. I'm not saying that in my own country I'm in jeopardy in any physical sense, but from the moment I took over this duty as a member of the Amici Curia, there were all kind of criticisms as to why I had agreed to do this. Among other things, and this was discussed in the Serbian Parliament. Of course, I will not uh, discuss that. There was also some discussion at the Faculty of Law by all the law professors who had many objections as to why I had decided to accept this highly responsible job. The objection being that I am taking upon myself an enormous, an enormous moral, professional, and historical role. I don't like big words, uh, highfalutin words, and this historic was used by others, not by me. And I was also uh, criticized for accepting to be an amicus curia in this case, whereas those same law professors in Belgrade have offered their services to this tribunal to act as amici curia. I was particularly criticized from the moral standpoint uh, that I <clears throat> had dishonored uh, the Serb morality because, as you may know or not, uh, from the middle of 96 until the middle of 97, I worked in a case uh, and I considered that to have been a great honor. I was defense counsel in the Celebici case for Mr. Mucic. That case is uh, in its final stages. And I uh, submitted uh, the opening uh, arguments. But the main criticism then was that as a Serb, I was defending a Croat in a case uh, uh, linked to a Muslim camp where the victims were Serbs alone. I said then, and I have to repeat that now, that all of us, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims, should be pleased to have had such a person because he helped uh, people not to have suffered more. And this should have been appreciated by both Serbs, Muslims, and Croats, uh, that there was such a person around. And uh, at the time, I made a comparison with Schindler, saying that he was a Schindler among the Croats. However, here I am again in a position to be a part of this case when both I and the accused come from the same state and belong to the same nation. Again, the same criticisms and the same reproaches and uh, risks for myself. I'm profoundly convinced that I can perform the duty of amicus curia as required uh, by my duties as a professional lawyer according to the rules that apply throughout the world. And I'm ready to bear full moral, professional, and even, if you will, historical responsibility 
to participate in this, these proceedings as an amicus courier. Believe me, I have had to make this statement because of the situation I am in, and I hope you will not take it against me. To complement what has already been said, uh, before coming to my particular point, I think the principle of fairness is a universal principle. And we have a court which in time, space, and personnel has limited its jurisdiction to a small area on the globe. I'm quite confident that this chamber can absolutely be fair within the framework of the rules. But that level of fairness would be absolute if the validity of these rules were to be universal. Until that is so, and you know the problems there are in the establishment of a permanent international court, and until this statute becomes universal, we will not be able to speak about absolute justice or fairness which does not mean to say that I am not confident that this chamber may be able to achieve absolute fairness, which perhaps will one day be achieved worldwide. Tiche. To come now to the problem uh, raised by Slobodan Milosevic in his... Uh, correspondence and submissions, and that is he underlined in particular that he considers that his surrender to this tribunal was not legal, was unlawful. And that brings me to the following issue. We cannot deny that at that point in time he had been lawfully in detention according to uh, the laws of Yugoslavia at the time. On the 28th of June, he was surrendered to this tribunal and arrested according to the l laws of the country earlier on. We also do not deny that he could have been surrendered by instruction of the judge of this tribunal because uh, detention had been ruled. However, who did the tribunal, or rather the prosecution, address via the tribunal because the tribunal issued an arrest warrant for the accused? Those requests uh, mainly or rather entirely, they couldn't, couldn't have gone otherwise, through the federal bodies. In, on the 24th of May 1999 and on the 22nd of June 2001 when Yugoslavia was again admitted to the United Nations. And this request was addressed to the federal organs, that is the Federal Ministry of Justice, and giving uh, primacy to uh, the tribunal and the rules of procedure was entirely in the hands of the federal bodies of Yugoslavia. There is no dispute over that. There was communication between the two, and the federal minister responded. And what is most important of all, very soon the federal ministry of justice undertook to draft a law which was uh, later transformed into a decree on cooperation with the Hague Tribunal. There is no law in Yugoslavia on the extradition of a national to any foreign body. We have a law on extradition of foreign nationals. And in view of that, the federal authorities undertook to pass a regulation in the for, form of a decree or a law that would enable cooperation with the Hague Tribunal. Therefore, what the prosecution is alleging is not true, and that is that the primacy of, 
of the tribunal is such that domestic legislation is totally unimportant. It cannot be unimportant. The fact that that state, as a member of the United Nations, undertook to pass regulations which would enable cooperation with the Hague Tribunal precisely as stipulated by the rules and statute of this tribunal. And what happened then? Without waiting for that law to be passed, or rather on the very day when the decree on establishing cooperation with the Hague Tribunal was in the final stages when it was before the Federal Constitutional Court. On that same day, the Republican government decided to uh, extradite Slobodan Milosevic to the Hague Tribunal. And as doing so, it acted arbitrarily. You know very well the provisions of international conventions. No one may arbitrarily jeopardize anyone, that everyone ha everything has to be done in accordance with a certain procedure and according to the law. And Yugoslavia was investing special efforts to overcome the problem. You are aware of the Tadic case. Tadic was arrested in Germany. Germany. Uh, worked for four months on the adoption of a law on the basis of which Tadic was extradited. So there was no reason not to wait. And this is something that the current president of Yugoslavia insisted upon, in particular, that legitimacy be given to everything. There was no need to turn any somebody into an ordinary object to be extradited. This was a decision taken by the government of the Republic, uh, which was not a member of the United Nations. It was only a member of the Federation, the Republic of Serbia. And it had no obligation to implement uh, anything linked to international covenants to which Yugoslavia is a signatory. This is something that only the federal government had the right to decide about, federal organs, through appropriate procedures, because they were doing everything to have the law adopted as soon as possible, and on the basis of that de decree to do what was necessary to establish cooperation with this tribunal and thus enable everything else uh, after that. By doing so, the state of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was prevented from examining uh, the instructions of the judge of this tribunal. And this is something that it should have been allowed to do, to examine the jurisdiction of this tribunal and take the appropriate decision and act accordingly because everywhere in the world, including in this case, this procedure should have been respected. Uh, the right whose extradition was requested uh, should have been respected. Only from Republika Srpska and now from Yugoslavia, people were extradited like objects. Uh, I have to say that. All I'm saying is that uh, laws have to be respected. And now I come to my most important point. Slobodan Milosevic would not have been delivered in this way because I assume if everything had uh, been carried out uh, according to procedure, the decree adopted, cooperation established, had there not been very great international pressure, and I'm sure that the prosecution were, took part in this, and the Serbian government, when the law on cooperation with the Hague Tribunal was adopted, the Serbian government arbitrarily made the decision it made. 
And as a result of such pressure on the national legislation, we now have Slobodan Milosevic here in this courtroom. And on the basis of such circumstances, it is not possible to base this case, and I mean the prosecution. And I must also say that I truly believe that you will devote special attention to this, and I think this is perhaps the most pressing problem to be addressed at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tepuskovic. Now, for the prosecution. Uh, who is going to address this? Madam Prosecutor, we've seen your brief, which covers the matter, if I may say, very fully. So uh, we'd be grateful if you could be fairly brief. Yes, Mr. President, Your Honours. I will be speaking in French, which the accused does not speak, but I will speak slowly so that he can follow the English on the screen if he decides not to make use of the headphones. He's, he's got uh, an interpretation which is being played to him in uh, Serbian. Thank you. I have to say that I had spoke in, in English in order to accommodate the accused uh, during the other hearings. Especially further to his refusal to put on a headset. But now, Mr. President and your honors, for me it is essential to be able to communicate with this uh, court in the other language of the tribunal, which is, comes more naturally to me and which allows me to express myself better in respect of the details without any. Uh, ambiguities creeping in. Uh, Mr. President and your honors, the accused Milosevic has said to us and has written to us and has repeated at the hearings, and I quote, we are an, an non-existent institution. And this morning, the Amici Curia have illustrated and have gone into depth in respect of all the themes of this uh, preliminary motion. And I would like to say that since having heard them this morning, I must say that they acted the way uh, ex way assigned counsel would react. But, Mr. President, I'm not going to ask that uh, a counsel be assigned. Things are as they are. I'm not going to insist. But I would simply like to take this opportunity to tell you that we have tried to get into contact with the Amichikuri before this hearing. They refused to do so. They did not wish to meet with us, which I lament, in fact. This is to let you know what problems are, that, the problems that we confront, these procedural difficulties difficulties in respect to being able to prepare the trial. Here with that, I don't know anything about this. Um, it's a matter for the um, Amici, the way that they choose to conduct this case. And it's not a matter for the court. And uh, if they choose to meet with the prosecution, then that's a matter for them. But if they choose not to, equally, it's a matter for them. And certainly there will be no criticism of them because of that. Uh, Mr. President, this was not a criticism, it was simply a factual observation. I would also ask that you allow me to say that I have had a study carried out on the right to self-representation. I have a study here, and I should say that the problem is open for me, and it is true that in customary international law does not contain the right to defend oneself without counsel. But I uh, go back to the main point. 
the charges as uh, the exchange of briefs and responses in writing in respect of the uh, preliminary motion on jurisdiction with all the things that follow up on that is sufficiently well known but even if uh, sometimes one should not always repeat things I would still like to um, to repeat several of the most important points the principal points in respect first of all of the legitimacy this uh, of this non-existent institution we have already three appeals uh, judgments the Tadic appeals judgment which in fact is an important judgment which uh, deals on the uh, with the substance of all the arguments raised here we have the Alexovsky judgment which goes back and follows up on the Tadic judgment and I believe that the three principles which have been recalled by the appeals chamber are untouchable here by this I mean the higher the establishment of a hierarchy of the administration of justice by ruling on questions of fact and law the guarantee of the need for uh, security and uh, the foreseeability and the rule of uh, international customary law that is the right to appeal which means therefore the accused's right that to have all of these matters dealt with in the same way. For this reason, the trial chamber complies with the judgments of the appeals chamber. The appeals chamber itself is following its own decisions, and we heard this morning through the Amici Courier the ex that the exchange of uh, of these cases, of these matters has been decided. The judgment in Celebici really simply confirms what has already been set forth as a principle. And I'd like to say to you, Your Honors, that we have no interest and no demands in, respecting, uh, in respect of asking for outside opinions. This advisory opinion, uh, which has been the subject of great pressure, is not necessary insofar as these decisions were already taken in previous cases. We are requesting, Mr. President, that the accused Milosevic recognize our jurisdiction and the jurisdiction of this tribunal. The international community has created this tribunal with the uh, D limited territorial jurisdiction, that's true, but we do not have temporal restriction, as was said this morning. We are asking, Mr. President, Your Honors, we are asking for the power to begin the, a trial against Mr. Milosevic. The three other principal meth reasons that I'm going to mention here are uh, the uh, prosecutor's independence because that is what is at stake here. In respect of uh, the independence of the court, there can be no, uh, uh, no, no challenge because that's in law and in respect that the Security Council urged the prosecutor to do what she is doing must be an element which fall within the category of a lack of uh, independence. I point out to the tribunal that resolution 1160 uh, of 31 March 1998, whereas the prosecutor announced on the 10th of March 1998 in public that the investigation into what happened in uh, Kosovo was going to begin. And therefore, I believe that this that small press release of the 10th of March, 1998, uh, should be given the importance that it deserves. And likewise, if the Security Council requested or urged the prosecutor, what does that really mean? 
It simply means that the prosecutor should be reminded of her original mandate in respect of the resolution which established this tribunal. And in the second place, to oh, being involved in opening an investigation does not mean that one is going to immediately issue an indictment. In respect of the prosecutor's discretionary powers, Mr. President, I cannot agree that this be put into question. And I have uh, no justification to provide f for saying that. I heard this morning what was said. I don't have to provide any proof. This is a discretionary power subject to the mandate from the Security Council. And that is it. Uh, we are asking to be able to bring a trial against uh, Mr. Malaz, who's a former head of state, and this is the second argument, former head of state. Here, uh, people don't want to understand. People do not want to understand that this tribunal was established by the inter international community explicitly for, in order to put an end to the impunity of powerful, the, the powerful people, the heads of states, and therefore, a review of their individual criminal responsibility in the exercise of their function is the task of this tribunal. And permit me to say, Mr. President, because outside the tribunal, there are thousands of victims who are demanding justice. For this reason, no immunity for anybody when what is involved are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And the Secretary General's report to the Supreme Council, uh, when in respect of the establishment of this tribunal, leaves absolutely no doubt on that issue. Because we know that the heads of state entail more significant responsibility for serious violations of international humanitarian law. And today, Mr. President, this is the turn of the accused Milosevic, who is uh, complaining, my last point, about an illegal transfer. I followed very carefully the transfer of the accused Milosevic, and I must tell you that he was arrested pursuant to a national warrant of arrest in his own country and was transferred uh, further to a decision of the, the government of Yugoslavia, the Republic of Yugoslavia, on the basis of a decree which was accepted and then suspended. And I am not going to go through the legislative CV of what happened in Yugoslavia, but this has nothing to do with the international obligation uh, that is we are familiar with uh, Article 29 of the statute. The, the only thing is that at the time that Yugoslavia became a member state of the United Nations, that obligation for Yugoslavia ex existed uh, further to the obligations uh, that every state would have. So the decision to transfer the accused was taken with full respect for the international obligations. And one final point, Mr. President, and you see that I was uh, very brief. The fact that the Amici Courier, the council are asking to allow him to speak. I must say that we have some problems in respect of the review of the exculpatory uh, documents because we don't have a person to speak with. I believe that I should find, a, I must find a solution, and I call upon presidents in order to find that solution. Uh, is it the accused himself that's going to look through all the documents? And I'm now speaking about uh, the application of Rule 60, which is just as important to me as any other application of the procedural rules. The, all this is to say to you, Mr. President, is that I feel that we must allow him to speak. Uh, that is the accused Milosevic. 
of course, uh, within the limits that we set forth. And I thank you, Mr. President. Um, <coughs> if I understand the argument of the amici on the question of transfer, it is that the obligation under Article 29 of the statute is an obligation of the of the state, and in that in this respect, they are saying that the arrest warrants were issued to the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, uh, when in fact the arrest and transfer were effected by the government of Serbia. In that circumstance, uh, they would say, as I understand it, that uh, Rule 58 uh, would not apply. <coughs> rule 58, as you know, is the rule which says that the obligations in Article 29 prevail over any legal impediment to the surrender of an accused to the tribunal. Now, <coughs> their contention is that the obligation is the obligation of the Federal Republic. What was implemented was a transfer by the government of Serbia. And they contend that for that reason, the, the transfer is, is illegal. You know. I raise this because you refer to Article 29. But what they're saying is that Article 29 was not, not complied with and that Rule 58 would be inapplicable. <coughs> what do you say to that? Yes, uh, Your Honor. As you know, in the Yugoslav Federation, the central government of the Federation has no uh, executing power. That is, all transfers, all decisions by the police or any uh, binding measures taken are carried out by the Republic of Serbia. The Republic of Serbia, which executes and which carries out the arrests and transfers, which is the case of the other accused who came from Belgrade. It is true that the decision is the one taken by the Federation. Now, the decision itself, uh, itself of, the, of the transfer is the Federation, and the pr Prime Minister Jinjic clearly mentioned this mentioned the fact that the decision to carry out the transfer was taken and accepted by the Federation. But the ex very execution, not only the accused Milosevic, of all things done by the police and the arrests that were carried out and transfers that were made and searches, all of those fall within the province of the Republic of Serbia. And that is why the transport itself was carried out by the Republic of Serbia. You are saying that um, this was properly the responsibility of the government of Serbia, the transfer. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It's the Republic of Serbia which must execute the transfer. In any event, you, um, I, I believe you would also say that the matter of the internal constitutional organization of a state uh, is, is irrelevant in a situation like this. <coughs> uh, there is a rule, um, Article 27 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which prevents a party from invoking the provisions of its, of its internal law as a justification for its failure to perform a treaty obligation. There is a treaty obligation here, and it must be performed. In your brief, you, I believe you mentioned that. It is mentioned uh, that it's Rule 58 of the uh, Rules of Procedure and Evidence. It says that the obligations. Well, she's reading it. Impediment to the surrender of transfer for the accused.
to the tribunal which may exist under the national law or extradition treaties of the states concerned. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the new point for me is uh, what you say, that it was in fact the responsibility of the government of Serbia to effect this transfer. Perhaps we'll hear from uh, a response from that from the uh, Thank you. Yes. Madam Prosecutor, there is really two points that I, I want to cover before the adjournment. Uh, the first is this. You refer to uh, uh, customary international law not containing a right to defend oneself. I find that most surprising. If it really does say that. It seems to be a fundamental right for anybody in a court to defend yourself. It, it, it may be we can uh, go into that at some other time. Uh, the, the other point is the point about exculpatory evidence, which of course is an important one. Uh, and it would seem to be sensible to discuss that during the status conference uh, and to decide what um, way of proceeding in relation to your obligations in relation to it. We, oui, Monsieur. Yes, Mr. President, as regards the self defending oneself, I can give you the a study that I had carried out by my special. It's a, it's a few pages long. It's interesting to read. And as regards the rest, yes, to Mr. President, we have to discuss that at the appropriate time because, indeed, it is important. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, you, you can pass that document through. Um, I have no reason to say we'll be bound by it. Uh, we'll adjourn now until half past uh, when we'll hear the accused. All right, as for you, Wolfie.